right now. Okay. So what we'll do today is to go over the exam one and a little bit of exam two from spring 2024. Okay. Um, so I've, I've done, you know, okay, what I have done here is I have extracted the markdown from both of those exams. So instead of just, you know, marking up on the PDF, I can actually put in the answers as, in, you know, interleaved with the questions. Um, it might be helpful for all of you to kind of pull out the actual exam also, you know, they are in the announcement so that you can actually read the, the question, you know, without having to see me scroll all the way back and forth, okay, because there will be quite a bit of your scrolling back and forth, okay, so having your own laptop or tablet or the desktop computer to stay on the questions, you know, can be helpful. All right, with all that said, I'm just gonna get started with you know, the, um, just the normal text. You know, we talked about this part already, you know, of you know, how the questions are going to be, um, you know, they all carry the same weight. So the strategy is to figure out you know, which ones are the easiest to start with. And then you time yourself, make sure you have enough time you know, to cover every single question. And then hopefully with some time left, so they can go back to some of the questions that you may not have enough time to finish and do that, you know, at the end of the entire exam time. The exam is going to be 40 minutes, I mean, excuse me, 80 minutes, which is the entire lecture period of next Wednesday. There will be no lab after the exam, but you're more than welcome to stay behind so that I can talk about the solution of the, you know, you know, of the answers. All right, so with that all said, I'm going to skip this portion because, you know, this is the portion that we have already talked about. So we're going to go straight to question number one. So question number one has you know, a lot of instructions here. I'm assu assuming that you guys already had a chance to read the exam, at least, uh, at least understand what you're supposed to do with this question. So I'm going to start with the actual answer. Once again, you, know, you can focus on the right-hand side on the screen, and I'll be using the left-hand side to type my answers. From point one all the way to 11, these are given to you. In other words, um, from one to six, those are the actual relationship between the individual binary digits in a binary subtraction. And then line seven to 11 are the given bits that we need to figure out. And we have to figure out basically all the rest, okay? Basically everything of X, Y, um, and D, and Q, and all the way from bit zero to bit two. All right, so th are there any questions about what you're being asked to do? No questions? All right. So if there are no questions, we'll start with number 12, because you know, number 12 is the first one where you actually have to provide an answer. So I'll be typing my answer, and it is going to be highlighted in yellow, you know, so just so that it's easy for you to distinguish which part is the question and which part is the answer. So part 12 is asking, how do I know that the negation of x1 and y1 or the negation of t1 and t1 has to be false? So the first thing is notation, okay? The first thing you have to notice is notation. The exclamation point is the same as logical negation. What looks like a multiplication is logical and. What looks like a arithmetic addition is logical or. Okay, so you have to remember, you know, in the context of a Boolean expression, those operators, you know, take on the meanings of, log of Boolean operators. Is that part okay? All right. <clears throat> so how do we know this? Well, okay, so there are a few ways to approach this particular exam. If I give enough information here, which is all the, everything here, as well as assuming that you guys have already taken CISP 360, which means you know what is negation, what is conjunction, and what is disjunction, someone does not even need to understand what is binary subtraction or have taken this class to answer this question. Okay? In other words, someone who knows how to apply logic and has a basic understanding of logical operators can answer question number one. The only question is, how long does he undertake? Okay, so that means, you know, if you, for people who study a lot and kind of have the knowledge, you know, can we call the knowledge just like that? 
those people would be able to do this question faster as opposed to someone who may not have the knowledge you know, already kind of <coughs> Yeah, who may not have memorized you know, some of the, the patterns here. All right, so with that said, we are going to look at you know, number 12 and ask how can we tell that the negation of x1 and y1 and, or the negation of q1 and p1 is going to be false. So one thing you, I hope you guys can do already is to really just look at the left-hand side of the inequality and recognize and go like, that's t2. This is T2 right here. So how do we know T2 has to be a zero? That's basically what the question is asking. So one thing you can do, okay, so is one, okay, so point one is important because that actually defines what is T2. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and type in your one. And there's one more, okay, you know, because one is just saying T2 is blah, blah, blah but it doesn't say it is zero. So you have to also combine that with seven in order to come to the conclusion that the entire expression evaluates to a false. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why one and seven both are needed in order to come to the conclusion that the expression um, of not x1 and y1 or not q1 and p1 is false? So let me talk about scoring a little bit. If this is the same question that you have, which is not gonna happen, the scoring is going to look at what you quote here. For people who only quote one, partial credit. For people who only quote seven, partial credit. For people who quote both of these and then something else, also partial credit, okay? Because I don't want someone to just quote one all the way up to 11, <laughs> knowing that at least it's, I'm gonna hit all the correct answers if I just say one, two, three, four, all the way up to 11. That is what I'm testing, okay? What I'm testing is, do you know exactly which one or your multiple ones um, are directly applicable, all right? But the beauty of this kind of question is the next one is completely or more or less completely independent to this one. So the next one, okay, I'm positioning my cursor key here so you can focus on the right-hand side is how do we know that the negation of x1 and y1 has to be false? What do you think? Because of 12. Because of 12, exactly, okay? Now, it is because of 12 and you know, how conjunction works. But as I said a little bit earlier, I made the assumption that you already know what is how conjunction, which is and, disjunction, which is or, and negation, which is not. I already assumed that you know how those operators work because of CIFT 360. So those rules are not spelled out anywhere here, which means in order to answer part 13, you only have to say 12. Does everybody understand why 12 is sufficient to make the conclusion that this is false? Is it good? All right. So now we move on to number 14, which is going to be the same, okay, because that really is just the other side of the expression, so this is also just because of 12, okay? So now we look at Q0 exclusive or with P0 being a zero, okay? So once again, you're being familiar with binary subtraction, it's gonna be very helpful, because if you're already familiar with binary subtraction, you can recognize that PQ0 exclusive or with P0 is just really easy. In other words, that this tells me that I need to look for D0 stuff, which is here, number nine is one of them, but then the definition or how it is expanded is also mentioned here in five. So five along with, okay, let me move my cursor here. So five and nine are the two that I need in order to make the conclusion that the exclusive or between Q0 and P0 has to be zero. Or zero. That would be a partial credit because five alone doesn't say anything about what this should be. So five alone does not you know, make the conclusion that it has to be a zero. So it's only when you combine five with nine that you know the expression is going to be false. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> All right, so now we move on to number 16 and I'm moving my cursor. 
let me move this monitor so I can I don't have to tilt my head. So we we are now looking at 16, which is how do we know x1 is a 1? So this one is a little bit trickier. Okay, the reason why we know x1 is a 1 has to do with we know what y1 is. Okay, so number 11. And there's one more. Uh, we also know that uh, this is with t0. Um, so it's not 11 then. It's number 10. 10 is one of them. All right, so we... So the trick is you can also just look up, you know, and find out, you know, uh, what equations mention t of zero, because in order to make a conclusion that t zero is true, you must rely on something that has to mention t zero. So um, number 10 does not mention t zero, but number 15 does. So between those two, I can make the conclusion. So that let's focus on, did I? Oh, I just, okay, that's, that's my fault because I misaligned my you know, answer. I'm still trying to answer x1 equals to 1, so cross that out. I just answer the next part, which is not what I wanted to do. Okay, so how do we know x1 is a 1? So what mentions x1? 13 does. Okay, so I'm going to potentially put down a 13. But 13 alone cannot conclude that x1 is a 1. We also have to conclude, figure out what is y1. So y1 is already known to be a 1 because of 11. So between these two, I can make that conclusion. So I apologize because I answered the next part. I was answering number 17 instead of 16. So this is the answer of 16. So this is the answer of 16 because if you look at 13, we know that the conjunction has to be come out as a false. However, if we look at 11, we know y1 is a 1. So with this conjunction, if one side is true and we have a conjunction and we want the result to be a false, so that means the other side of the conjunction has to be a false. Okay? But in order for not x1 to be a false, that means x1 has to be a true. So that's how we can conclude that x1 is true on line 16. So now we move on to line 17. Let's see. So this is the one that I was working on a little bit earlier, erroneously. So in order to tell that t0 is a 1, I can rely on something that mentions something about t0 and some other bit that we already know. So on line 15, we have you know, a relationship between t0, q0, and the result of a, a false. So when I combine that with line 10, I can now make that conclusion. Because line 15 says, the exclusive or between q0, t0 has to be false, which basically tells me that t0, q0 have to be, they have to have the same value. But if they have to have the same value, and I look at number 10, it tells me that q0 is a 1 already, so that means p0 also has to be a 1. Does that make sense? Okay. So there we go. Um, moving on to line 18. So line 18 is asking, how do we know that x1 exclusive or with y1 has to be a zero? So once again, if you're familiar with binary subtraction, then you recognize that, oh, we are really just talking about q1 being a zero, okay? Because q1 is the exclusive or between x1 and y1. So now we have a few things that we can look at. Anything that mentions x1, y1, or q1 potentially is useful for us. So now we look up uh, y1 is a 1 is up here with 11. So we'll, I'll just kind of write down the clues that might be useful and then later on decide whether that is actually useful or not. So 11 potentially is useful. I also want to know, you know whether we know anything about q1 at this point. So I have to scroll up. Okay, so look up here. q1 is not known yet okay and we want the exclusive or to be a false so let's see 11 means the y1 is a 1 
So, oh, that's enough already. Okay, just because of the 11. Because if I know y1 <coughs> is a 1, then I need x1. Oh, no, wait, that's not, that's not the case. We know x1 here. Okay, so we know x1 and y1. Because we know we conclude x1 is a 1 because of 16. So that is the answer. All right, so let's take a look. Because of 11, we know y1 is a 1. That is just given. Because of 16, uh, we also know that x1 is a 1. 1 exclusive or with 1 is a 0. So that's how we know that the exclusive or between x1 and y1 has to be a 0. Is that okay? All right. All right, so now we want to know why Q1 is a zero. So this is the one where we need to rely on the definition of Q1. So we are going to make use of <clears throat> uh, 20, uh, no, 18. And we also need to look up the definition of Q1. Now, I already know the Q1 definition is you know just the exclusive or between uh, X1, Y1, but that's uh, number four. So we just have to say and four. There we go. So are we still doing okay so far with this? All right. Um, and then we move, move on to line 20. Line 20 is saying, okay, how can we conclude that x0 exclusive or with y0 is a 1? So this time, okay, we don't know what is x0 or y0 yet. Now, if people are going like, but we do because, you know, it's right here. We know x0 is a 1, y0 is a 0. That is not correct, okay? Because we, we have to make all the deductions in the order as specified. In other words, there's no forward referencing of the lines that are after a line. You can only do referencing to things that we have already concluded. So that means we cannot rely on 28 or 29 to make the, the conclusion that the exclusive or between x0, y0 is a 1. So now you have to go back and go like, ah, okay, that doesn't work. So we go all the way back to the beginning, and we can see how q0 is x0 exclusive or with y0. And we also know that q0 is a 1. So between those two, we have our answer. So we are looking at 6 and 10 in this case. I'm going to insert my answer, 6 and 10. Do we have any questions about this one? And then we move on to line 21. So line 21 is, um, is interesting, okay, because it also is testing how well you know the material that is already in the notes, okay? So what is that? Okay, if I just focus on the left-hand side of the equality, which is the negation of x0 and y0, and y or x0 and the negation of y0, what is that? That's exclusive or. <clears throat> okay, you know, it is the same. This expression here is the same as x0 exclusive or with y0. So now we ask, how do we know that is a 1? Oh, okay, it's just because of the previous line, which is line 20. So now we answer this question, which is just line 20. There we go. And because of the definition of exclusive or, but the operator or how an operator is defined is not, you know, anywhere here. So that means we don't, there's nothing else we need to quote other than you know, just line 20. All right, so at this point, we want to conclude why t of 1 is a 0. So we have to go back and say, okay, so you can either work forward or work backwards, okay? To work forward, that means you, know, you need to know x0, y0, q0, t0 in order to figure out what is t1. That's not going to happen because we don't know what is x0, y0 yet. So that means we kind of have to rely on something else, you know, potentially working backwards. So we want to figure out you know, how T1 relates to things that we already know. So let's go ahead and figure out what is known already. What is known already are in the boxes. So that's why I put a box around everything that are known bits. 
so that it's easier for you to see what is known already at this point. So we know what is Q1 and we know what is, okay, we don't know what is D1 yet. Okay, so that's not going to help. Um, let's see. What do we do know is T2. We know what is T2, so potentially that can be helpful. If we know what is T2, especially when it is a false, T2 depends on T1, but it depends on T1 in this particular way. So we, this is T2, we know T2 is a zero already, and we want to conclude what is T1. So the only thing is, you know, do we know what is Q1 at this point? And we do know what is Q1 at this point. So I'm going to put the answer down first, which is based on line 1 and line 19, okay, 1 and 19. Okay, so I will put the answer down and then we'll talk about it. 1 and 19. All right, so let's, let's try to figure out why I can make that conclusion that Q1 has to be 0 just because of line 1 and line 19. So what does line 1 says? Line 1 says T of 2 is the negation of Q1 and T1. Is that okay? Well, okay, the negation of X1 or and Y1 or the negation of Q1 and T1. But we know T2 is a zero already, so that's line seven. I have to include line seven here too. So we'll say one, seven, and 19, because all three are needed. There's another way to do this one too, but this is the first way that I figure out. Okay, so we'll go with this one. All right, so getting back to one, we know this is zero, which means the or has to give me a zero. But in order for OR to end up with a zero, both sides need to be zero. So that means your know, Q1, not Q1, and T1 has to be a zero. But we know that T1, um, one of them, which is Q1, yeah, we know Q1 is a zero. So if Q1 is a zero, then not Q1 is going to be one. So the only way for this conjunction to end up with a zero is for T1 to be a zero. So that's one way to figure out that T1 has to be 0. If I remember correctly, there's another way to figure out why we know T1 is a 0. So let's go ahead and see if there's another way to do this. Um, oh, that's an easier one. 14 and 19. Okay, that's actually way easier than this one. <laughs> but just because it's easier doesn't mean that it is the most immediate answer. Okay, you can also use, what did I say, uh, 19 and 25, yeah, 19 and 25 you know, would also do it. Oh, no, that's 25 is in the future. So it's 19. Oh, 14. 14, yep. Mm -hmm. 19 and 14, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at why 19 and 14 would, would also give us the answer. 19 says your Q1 is a zero. And then 14 says, you know, the conjunction between Q1 and T1 has to be zero, which is the right-hand side of the earlier, you know, of number one. So it is a more concise way to do it. But for the same reason, basically. Is that okay? So both of these answers are acceptable, you know, as full credit, you know, answer. 1719 is a little bit of a longer path. But you know, between 19 and 14 is a much more direct way to answer this question. Are we good so far? If any, at any time you have any questions, you'll just let me know. Okay. Yep. What do you use the boxes again? Say again. What do you use the boxes? The boxes? Yeah. The boxes is just to emphasize you know, what bits are already known. Like you know, we have fully resolved the value of those particular bits. It makes it easier. It just stands out a little more so that we can easily see, oh, okay, at this time, we already know the individual bit values of the, everything in the box. Okay, so now we look at this one, and this is easy because this is how T1 is computed, and we just need to say 
how is T1 defined and T1 is a zero, which is line 22 and something way before. So line 22 and the actual definition of T1, which is two. So to answer this part, it is line two and the line right before, which is line 22. Okay, so once again, okay, I know I have been repeating this, but it doesn't hurt to repeat again. It's important to really know how things are related. As I said a little earlier, someone who doesn't understand anything about binary subtraction can potentially answer this entire question. But it will take longer because that person will actually have to um, you know, go by the, the actual definitions all the way up here instead of just going like, oh, I recognize what this is. This is T1. This is how T1 is defined. Okay. All right, the next one, okay, this one is easy because we have seen that already. So this is just you know, because of the line right before, which is line 23. Because if the disjunction or the or ends up with a zero, that means both sides need to be a zero. This turns out to be just the left-hand side. So that's why you know, we can conclude the negation of x is zero and y zero has to be false. All right, the next one is q1 exclusive or with p1 is a zero. And I believe at this point, we already know what is q1 and what is t1. We just have to quote the lines that mention that, okay? So we can see that t1 and q1, okay, they're both visible. They are 19 and 22 respectively, okay? Because on line 19, we make the conclusion that q1 is a zero. On line 22, we, we make a conclusion that t1 is a zero. The zero exclusive or with zero is zero. So that's how we can make the conclusion on line 25 that the exclusive or between Q1, T1 is a zero. Are we still doing okay? All right. So the next one is to ask how do we know that D1 is a zero? So that's easy. It's because of the line before, which is line 25, and the how we define D1. So line 25 and Okay, so we look at how D1 is defined, which is all the way up here. It is line three. There we go. That answers number 26. And then on line 27, it is asking how do we know that X is zero and the negation of Y zero is a one. There's only one place that expression is out by itself. It is right here, okay? So we know line 21 has to be a part of the answer, okay? So we'll say, okay, line 21 is definitely one of the answer, but it is not alone because you know, just line 21 alone does not say that you know, which side is what because all line 21 is saying is at least one side of the disjunction is a one. We don't know whether it is just the right-hand side, just the left-hand side, or both sides. So that means, you know, in order to make a conclusion that the right hand side is a one, we need to also show that the left hand side is false. Okay, so now we look for uh, the negation of x zero and y zero is false. That is line 24. So we just have to combine line 21 and 24. Then we can make the conclusion that x zero and the negation of y zero has to be true. Yep. Can you also say 24 and 20? 24 and 20. 24 is this one, and then 20 is this one. Um, let me see. So there are two ways for x0, zero, y0 zero to be exclusive or with y0 <coughs> to be a one. So it's either a zero, one this way or zero, one that way. I'm not sure sure how you can make that argument. You mean this one, line 20 and line 24? Okay, let's let's try to figure that out, okay? Because I I'd like to find it out. Okay, so if we know that x0 exclusive or with y0 is a 1, that gives us two possibilities. Because we can have x0 being a 
0, so y0 being a 1, or we can have x0 being a 1, y0 being a 0. Okay, so that means you know, now we have to rely on line 24 as a constraint to restrict which one is the answer. So on line 24, the negation of x0, y0 in this case, um, it would make line 24 false, okay? So line 24 is consistent with only this line. So the answer is yes, we can actually make that argument. All right, I'll write it down. It's a, to me, it is a less direct you know, inference, but it does work too. So that also works. Thank you, very good. But this is how I worked it out, okay? You know, because you know, from line 20 by itself, I have two possibilities. And then I look at line 24 and ask, does line 24 rule out one of these possibilities? And it does. So now we have, we have only one possibility left, which means you know, we come to the conclusion that um, you know, those two work out. All right, very good. That is really smart. So now we get to here. Um, this is the direct result of line 28, okay? Because of the because line twenty eight says you know, the conjunction between x zero and the negation of y zero has to be one. But in order for conjunction to be a one, <coughs> both sides of the conjunction needs to be ones. So that means x zero needs to be a one. The negation of y zero needs to be one, which means y zero has to be a false. Yep. Because twenty eight becomes twenty eight. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, self-referencing does not work here. So they're both 27. Thank you. All right, so that's uh, question number one. Yep. For number 27, can you also um, reference just uh, 24? Because not of x0 and, or not and, or of y0 has to be zero. That's, a, that's an and. This is an and, and because it's an and, it is not sufficient. I cannot make the conclusion. What looks like a multiplication is conjunction. All right, so that means, you know, in the, on the day of the exam, it is helpful for you to have a, an area on your notes, you know, to basically just have all the notation explained. Yep. Because in order for a conjunction to return a one, both sides need to be one, yeah. So that means you know, this side by itself needs to be one, which means the negation of y zero has to be one, which means y zero has to be one. So that's already sufficient. All right. Are we doing okay so far? Yep. You mean on the same line? On the same line, the order does not change because it's a conjunction. We, we need to rely on both of these, so which one you focus does not change. Yeah. Are we good with number one? Hmm? Sure. I have the whole thing being recorded, the lecture itself, and I can also give you the markdown um, on the left-hand side. So that way you guys can take that and then make your own annotation on it as you're studying. Mm -hmm. All right. So given this is how we answer this particular question, does it give you some idea of how what you need to study and what you might want to put on your, you know, your uh, study guide that you can bring with you to the exam. I hope it does, okay, you know. All right, oh, the funny thing is um, I asked ChatGPT for this, you know, for the answer to this question. Last year or last semester, uh, with ChatGPT 3.5, it just couldn't figure it out at all, okay? It just gave me a bunch of gibberish, but confidently, you know, so this year, <laughs> With Chat GPT 4.0, it was able to figure out most of it, but with some of the, the ones where you know a hint is given, it was it, it basically says it's, it's, it's a given, it's assumed. 
So we couldn't figure out some of these. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you guys are more than welcome to <clears throat> like get rid of the answers and then you know, copy the, uh, the markdown up to chat to GBT and see how it answers the question. And then you will see that the AI still cannot quite figure out everything yet. Okay, it can figure out some of them, but not everyone. All right, question number three. So question number three has to do with signed versus unsigned interpretation, the range of values, and so on and so forth. So we, okay, so we'll, I'll just read the whole question here. So this is the uh, BSWN is the signed interpretation of a bit pattern W only using the least significant ending. You are given that X and Y are both M bit numbers. So M is not the same as N over here. And S is the result of X plus Y, okay? So S is just you know, the sum between X and Y using an M bit binary addition. We discovered that S represents negative 16, X represents negative seven, and Y represents negative nine. But we don't know what M is, okay? So what part of what we need to figure out is what is M. Note that the scoring of this question may have part dependency. In other words, a later part may not be scored if an earlier part is incorrect or omitted. Okay, so now we move on to part one. The two complements, the two comp the two's complement of a bit pattern C2, thus the same as arithmetic negation, which we talked about in the signed versus unsigned discussion. This means that C2 of U is the same as negative V. Okay, so this is actually V over here. They're not both U's. Assuming U is the binary number representing the value V. Okay, so V is the what the value is being represented by U. U is the actual bit pattern. How is C of two defined? So this one has no problem solving, you know, component to it. This is a purely just a knowledge kind of question. So to answer this question, I forgot to put uh, the span thing here. So I'm gonna do it here. Okay. And it doesn't like it because I forgot the quote uh, and the double quote. There we go. Okay. So all this really wants to do is to say, do you know how two's complement is defined? That's all. So you just have to say, yep, we know how two's complement is defined. It is, so the two's complement of a bit pattern U is the one's complement of the same bit pattern plus one, which is bitwise not, okay, which is you know, the tilde symbol of U and then the whole thing plus one. So that would be the correct answer in this case. This is actually in the notes, okay? As I said, you know, this is, this is one of the definitions already given to you in the signed versus unsigned module, okay? So next one is, you know, for 10%, I'm asking in a signed integer representation, the most significant bit is known as the signed bit. What is the value of this bit for all signed representation of non-negative values? Okay, so um, I'm gonna copy the, the span here because I don't feel like typing it. So copy, uh, oops, there we go. Okay, so what, what is the answer to this question? I mean, the zero, huh? zero is correct, very good. Do, do we have any questions about what the question is asking? Because when you read the question, every single word is easy to understand. But what the question is asking can be a little bit, it takes a little bit of time to input. Yes, if the number one and you just put um, bit wise not and you just put one. Yep, that's, that's, that's fine. Yep. Yep. Just this part is fine. So for number two, it is a zero because you know, the, because the the power of two corresponding to the position of the sine bit is subtracted from the summation of the rest, and we have already kind of informally shown we have been shown that you know if the sine bit is a one, the value being represented is always guaranteed to be negative. 
So if the value being represented is not negative, it means the sine bit has to be zero. All right. So moving on to the next question. Okay. So this one is asking, since x is negative 7 is negative, uh, find the binary representation of the absolute value of x. So the answer to this question is, um, I, I can you know, give you the long version. Okay, so the absolute value Okay, it doesn't like that. So it's math, <coughs> TT, ABS. It just doesn't know what is ABS, basically. Um, all right, so the absolute value of negative 7 is 7, which is 1 plus 2 plus 4. And, okay, I, that's my bad. This is my bad. I forgot to use curly braces instead of parentheses. Okay, there we go. Looks better this way. Equals to um, 1 in base 2 plus 1 0 in base 2 plus 1 0 0 in base 2, which is 1 1 1 in base 2. So I'm doing base conversion, you know, and showing that, oh, okay, 7, which is the absolute value of negative 7, can be represented by 1 1 1 as a bit value. So number two, okay, the next question is to determine the number of bits that are needed. Now, the important part here is we are relying on signed representation. The signed representation or the, the value based on signed interpretation of 111 is not negative 7. Yeah. For 31, would it be sufficient to just put 111? You have to show the steps. Yep. So you have to show at least one step here. At least you show that this is 1 plus 1, 0 plus 1, 0, 0. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So part two. Part two of three. Okay. So 3.2, which is this question here. <clears throat> the minimum number of bits that are needed is not three. It is four. So I'm going to put the answer here first, and then see if you guys have any questions about it. <clears throat> Why do you think it is four? Because you need to put the negative sign. Yep. It has to do with a range of values that can be represented. Right. Yep. Would it be because it's uh, in reference to a signed bit space? So if yep. it was three bits, one, 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 you would not... Because one 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 would would represent negative one instead of seven in signed interpretation, and then the next one is related to this one. Finally, compute the signed binary representation of uh, negative seven. So this one is just you know uh, basically the two's complement of zero one 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 in base two, and that becomes you know as you know since we can shortcut this. Um, it is the negation of 0, 1, 1, 1 in base 2 plus 1, which is 1, 0, 0, 0 in base 2 plus 1, which is 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2. Is that okay? So that's just the application of two's complement. Are we good with this one? Okay. And then the next part is Kind of the same deal, you know, just working on a different number. So in this case, you know, um, I would just say that 9 equals to 1, 8 plus 1, which is 1, 0, 0, 0 in base 2, plus 1 in base 2, which is basically the same as 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2. And I forgot, okay, I forgot to put the uh, dollar sign in front and to the back. To turn this into an equation, there we go. Looks better. Okay, so the number of bits that we need to represent uh, negative nine—that's nine. So in order to represent negative nine, that means we need five bits. Because otherwise, okay, this is a really interesting example. 
because if I just look at one zero zero one, it is actually representing negative seven. So we need five bits in order to represent nine in a find fashion. Is that okay? All right. So now we look at the next question. Finally, compute the find uh, binary representation of negative nine. Kind of the same deal. Okay, we look at zero. 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2. And I should remember to use the dollar sign to change it into equation. Oops, not here. But here, there we go. All right, so this is, you know, the bitwise knot of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2, the whole thing plus 1, which is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 in base 2 plus 1, which is 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 in base 2. Are we good so far? So this part is just the application of Q's complement. All right, so for the next part, for 10%, if X and Y are to use the same number of bits, which is W, to represent them, what is the minimum width or minimum number of bits that we need? So in this case, you know, W is, huh? Yeah, five is correct. So it's the maximum between four and five, which is just five. And max is just to make it look neater, I say. No? Okay. So for number six, this is the signed binary representation of S out of range in a in in out of the range of a W bit signed integer. The answer is, is it yes or no? Hmm? Yes. It is not. Five bits, okay, so explain your conclusion. Okay, let's go ahead and explain the conclusion here. The answer is no, not out of range. Okay, so why is it not out of range? Yep. Because of five bit space uh, exceeds what the maximum value of negative seven could yep. be. So you have to explain what is that five bit space, you know, from what value to what value. So we can explain and say that a five bit signed integer can represent from negative from a two negative two to the power negative in parentheses two to the power of w minus one, which is your know, four in this case, two uh, oops, two um, positive two to the power of four. The whole thing minus one. So you know, if I were to give it an actual value, this is negative 16, and this one here is 15. In other words, if I give you a five bit signed integer, the value that we can represent is ranging from negative 16 to positive 15. The result of negative seven plus negative nine is exactly negative 16. So we can barely represent the sum between x and y in this case. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So this particular question, the way it is asked as it is now, you know, obviously you need to understand what is truth complement, why it is useful, how it can be applied, and also you know, how do we know the range of values given an, a certain width of signed integer in this case. Does that mean I don't have to learn anything about, or does, does that mean I don't have to know anything about unsigned representation? No. You know, this is this is a particular version of your know, midterm, I mean, exam one. So it doesn't mean that you know, unsigned is not gonna be asked, okay? It's just that in this particular question, I only asked about signed representation. All right? Because I don't want people to look at this exam and go like, oh, okay, so that means I don't have to deal with unsigned integers. Unsigned integers is still in the scope of exam one. All right, so, so here's question number four. So question number four is giving you a base seven subtraction, and I want you to figure out basically all the question marks. But there's also some other stuff I want you to figure out. 
So the first question is to say, okay, if I just look at the row of y, what is the value represented by the row of y? So y is two, three to six in base seven. And I want to find out what exactly is the value represented here. So let me answer that question. So now we say three, two, six in base seven is three times, okay? So it'd be three times seven to the power of what? Two or three? Two, that's correct. Because we count from zero, so that means your digit two is the one that is the third place from counting from, counting to the left hand side. And then we have to add two times uh, seven to the power of one, and then we have to add six times seven to the power of zero. And you can use a calculator to actually perform the calculation. Um, so three times seven squared, which is 49, is 147 plus 14 plus six. And then you can either use a calculator or use mental math. I think it is 167. Yep. So that's the answer of number of the first part. The second part is asking you about the definitions. So this part has nothing to do with problem solving skills, but it does have everything to do with, you know, do you know how things are defined? So in this particular case, I'm asking in base seven, how is R defined in the subtraction? So that would be defined as seven minus U minus W, oh, plus U, sorry, seven plus U minus w, and then the whole thing mod the base, which is seven. Are we good so far with this? Okay, because this is actually defined in the binary addition and subtraction module. Even though the module is titled binary addition and binary subtraction, we went through the math, okay, the theory of your know, performing addition and subtraction basically in any base. And this is asking about that. All right, so next question is about the borrow function. So the borrow function is, um, you know, there are other ways to say this, you know, but I'm just going to quote the way that I say that. It is, um, if this is true, we return a true, otherwise we return a false. So we'll, I'll put, I'll turn this into equation. There we go. All right. And then the, the next one asks you know, how is Q of I defined? So we just have to say Q of I is defined as the R of XI by I. And then the next one asks what is D? So D of I is the R of QI, QI, and then T of I plus one is defined as, I mean this one is the slightly longer one. This is defined as the D of XI, YI, or, so you can either use a plus or a, you know, or symbol, um, D of QI, all right, so let me highlight you know, this entire portion here. Everything from here all the way down to here, that's about knowledge. It is not about the application of knowledge. It really is just knowledge, okay, because all of these are defined in the module, and you just have to find the definitions and write it down, and you get, let's see, 25, which is 25%, you know, which is one quarter of all the points for this particular question. Now is this the big QOI because D uh, hmm? is equal to uh, times QI? Or is hmm? it the same thing if you do the final response? Mm, nope, it would not be the same because the times or the conjunction thing only works with, in binary. This is not in binary. This question is in base seven. So it's not the same thing. 
that's the whole reason why we have to make this definition here is because you know this works in base seven. It works in base two too, but this entire question is on base seven, as opposed to the first question, which is all the way up here. This one is based on base two. So you can only use the logical operator instead of you know arithmetic operator when you are when you're working with base two numbers. This one is not base two. All right. So now we want to figure out you know the table. So instead of um, making an well, I can I guess I can make another table. So let me do that over here. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight line here. We'll just copy and paste it. So this way, you know, I can just kind of work on the answer here. All right. So let's try to figure out all the unknown digits in base seven. Okay. What minus six gives us a single digit difference of four? This should remind you of one of the lab activity that we did already, right? Okay. So now you have to kind of go backwards and you ask. Oh, okay, so whatever with the question mark is minus 6 is 4. You go like, okay, so if I don't care about the base, it's going to be 4 plus 6, which is a 10. But 10 is not a single digit in base 7, right? So now you have to say, okay, what is 10 mod 7? 10 mod 7 is a 3, so 3 goes here. Okay, does that make sense? Well, Let's go the other way around, okay? Let's go in the opposite direction. And you ask, what is three minus six? What is the single digit of three minus six in base seven? Do we know how to do that? We just figure out for how R of something is defined. So R of three six is three plus seven, because that's the base, which is 10, minus six, which is a four, mod seven, which is also a four. So that's how you utilize you know, all the definitions that we just, you know, of the earlier part in order to figure out this is a three. This one is super easy, okay, because you know, this is asking what minus two is a zero? What do you think? It has to be another two. This one is also easy. What minus three is a three? Since six is still representable in base seven, it's just a six. And then we look at the borrow here. Okay, so the borrow here is asking, is three minus six going to end up in four? So the question, so you, you go back to the definition of the E function, right? E is less than six. If so, return a one. If not, return a zero. Is three less than six? Yes. Okay, so that answered that question. What about this one? 2 minus 2 means it does not need to borrow, but 0 minus 1 does, okay? So that means, you know, the, the definitions of how t of i plus 1 is defined is completely useful here. And as a result, this one is going to be a 0, and now we just have to figure out the difference, which is the q, I mean, which is the r function of value applied between the q and t. 4 minus 0 is, a, is 4. <clears throat> 0 minus 1, on the other hand, is 0 plus 7, the whole thing minus 1, which is 6. 6 mod 7 is still a 6, so we put a 6 here. And this is a 2. That's how we figure out all the individual bits. Do we have any questions about how these individual bits are figured out? by the application of the R function and also the B function. Are we good here? Any questions? Shouldn't the L algorithm simplify and start doing it? Hmm? Shouldn't the L simplify and start doing it? Why would it be a 164? 3 minus 1 is a 2. Okay, but you're in 1 and So once again, you know, we have to know how the bits of how the digits are related. D of i, in this case d of two, d of two is the R of Q2 T2. In other words, this two 
is the result of applying the R function on 3 and 1. The R of 3 comma 1 is 3 plus 7, which, which is 10. 10 minus 1 is a 9. 9 mod 7 is a 2. So you know, I'm pretty sure this 2 is correct, assuming that Q, the Q value of bit 2 is a 3, the P value of bit 2 is a 1. So if I made a mistake with the computation of these two, then yes, this may not be the correct answer. But assuming that these two digits are correct, this is the correct answer. All right. So we do okay so far with this. Okay. So now we go back to the question. Okay, we just figure out all three rows. The last part is if I look at the D row, you know, in, in using a decimal representation, what is that representing? So that would be, okay, so I'm just gonna put it next to here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put it here. So this whole thing is two times 49, which is seven to the power of two, plus six times seven to the power of one, which is just seven itself, plus four times one. So that becomes 98 plus 42 plus four. 98 plus 42 is 150. 154 is the answer. And there we go. 44. Huh? 44. Yep, you're right. 144. There we go. Excellent. So we still have enough time to cover the last question. So this is question number three from exam two because I changed the material a little bit. So the floating point number representation is now in exam one as opposed to in exam two. All right. So once again, I want to make the point that anyone who can understand and read this entire expression can answer this question. That person does not have to take this class at all. Okay? So, but if you study the material, it is a little faster. Okay? Because you, then you will know, okay, I know which digits are and so on and so forth. So I put this equation here, what the definition of you know, the value, the dub, the value in the value represented by x when interpreted as a double, I put it here just so that, you know, in case someone forgot about this whole thing, they don't have to ask me, so what is a double? How do we interpret the bits of a double? There you go, okay? This is it. So we talked about this in class two. And the first, but the questions is in multiple steps, which means you can get partial credit along each step. So we'll answer the first question first. The first question is asking you to express the bit pattern of D in binary, and you can use the 0, dot, dot, 0 notation as long as you tell me how many zeros it is enclosing. Okay, so let's go ahead and answer that part of the question. So the way we do this is we do a conversion between base 16 and base 2. Do you guys remember how to do a base 16 to base 2 conversion? How many people wrote down that table when we talked about the base 16 to base 2 conversion? Okay, very good. So here we go. Okay, every digit in base 16 converts to exactly four binary digits. Okay, so that's the important part. All right, so we'll, I'll just kind of go with the four first. Okay, the four is converted to 0, 1, 0, 0. The 0 is just 0, 0, 0, 0. The six is zero one one zero. The C is one one zero zero. The nine is one zero zero one, and the rest are all zeros. So now the question is, how many zeros do we have here? In other words, you know, how many zeros am I trying to use this notation to convert? Well, the whole thing needs to have sixty-four bits, right? There are twenty that we already figured out. So 64 minus 20 is 44. So that means you know, we have 44 zeros in the dot dot notation. So we'll go ahead and just say 44 
zeros here. And this is all in base two. Just to emphasize this is in base two, I'm just gonna put a parentheses to here. So do we have any questions about number one? Okay. So unless you are familiar with base 16 to base two conversion and do it, can do it in your head like I can, you might want to put that table on the sheet of one of the sheets of paper that you bring to the exam. Does that make sense? I mean, if you don't need it, fine, okay? But if you do need it, it's like, I'm not quite sure what E is. Okay, then you can just look at the table instead of trying to derive the table on your own using the exam time. All right, the next question is, what is the position of the sign bit? Your answer should look like D subscript 20 because I want you to know, I want you to tell me what bit is representing the sign in a double representation. So, um, which one is it? D of, D of what? There are 64 bits, okay? If you randomly guess, you have a one in 64 chance of guessing it correctly. In case you don't know the answer, okay? In case you, you have not studied at all for this entire test, okay? Where do you go to find the answer? Asking me in the exam is not gonna help because I'm going to give that, if, if anyone is asking me, you know, I don't know how the bits are utilized in a double, the answer that I'm gonna give that person in the exam is, this is exactly what I'm trying to test you. <laughs> okay? No, 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 it's, you're close, okay? I, I think you meant the correct bit, but you said it incorrectly. It is in here. The answer is spelled it's out in the question itself. If bit 63, is true, then use negative one to multiply to the rest of the product. Right there. Bit 63 is the sign bit. Okay? So the answer is actually embedded in the question itself. It is a part of the question. Okay? So now we go back here and we just say, oh, okay, we now know it is bit 63. Is that okay? So part of what I really want you guys to do is to learn how to read the mathematical notation, okay? The summation, the sigma notation, you know, which part is the power, which part is the exponent, and so on, because mathematics is important in computer science, okay? All right, next question. What is the range of bits corresponding to the biased exponent? What exactly are these bits? Um, the answer should look like this. Basically, you're trying to tell me what is the most significant part, what is the least significant part, and what is the exact bit pattern in, the, in this particular question. All right, so once again, the answer is embedded in the question itself, okay? You look at this huge mess of, a, of an equation, of a formula, which we have explained in class, okay? So now you look at this and go like, okay, which part is the biased exponent? Where do you look? Well, if it's a biased exponent, which mean, that means it is probably the power of something, right? This is a power of something, okay? But it is, you know, this part here is just, you know, figuring out, you know, the value of a binary number. So the biased exponent is this, this part over here excluding the minus the subtraction of 1023. That is your, that's your biased exponent. So now the next question is, which bits are used to, to represent the biased exponent? So when you look at this sigma notation, x subscript i, you know, the i here, that's my uh, bit position. So that means you know, bit 52 to bit 62 is the range. Okay, so to answer that question, I just have to go back to here and just kind of write it down. Okay, so the answer is, let me scroll back up a little bit. There we go. So 
the answer is it is d subscript 62 the most significant part all the way down to d uh, subscript 52 which is the least significant bit and in this case you have to look up the actual bit pattern here this is bit 62 this is bit 52 so everything from here all the way down here is the actual bit pattern so you just have to copy that so it would be one zero zero one two three four zero zero one one zero in base two. That would be the answer to this question. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what the question is asking and why this is the answer? Yes. Huh? No. You can probably count the same bits. One two three four five six seven. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> All right, so that one is done. Moving on to the next one. Step by step, compute the value of the unbiased, with a UN being italicized, exponent of two. Express your answer in base 10. Okay, so let's try to answer this question. Here, okay. So now we look at this and go like, okay, this is one zero, one two three four five six seven one one zero in base two, and we have to subtract one thousand twenty three, so that would be one thousand twenty four plus four plus two minus one thousand twenty three, and I believe the result is a seven. So you have to do base conversion first, okay? So this is the binary representation. You also have to know what is the biased amount. It is 1,023. So the unbiased number minus the biased amount is the unbiased exponent, which turns out to be just seven in this case. Is that okay? Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. All right, so the next part ask, asks, how is the mantissa of D, of you know, the bit pattern D represented in the bit pattern? Show how bits of D are utilized and express the mantissa of D as a base two number. Okay. All right, so kind of the same deal. It's asking, you know, what is the mantissa being represented in a double? And in this particular case, what does it look like? So the, the mantissa is going to be one point, okay? And then we just have a whole bunch of bits, okay? So one point, the, uh, the digit immediately to the right-hand side of the point is D of 51. And then we go all the way down to D of zero. That's basically the mantissa itself. Um, show how bits are used, blah, 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 okay? I think this answers both of the questions. So this is the same thing, okay? How do we know this? Because this is derived directly from this equation. This entire part is the mantissa. The one point is something that is mandatory. It is not a part that is represented by any of the 64 bits of a double. But when you look at the actual bit, starting with bit position 0 to bit position 51, they are utilized here. Bit 51 is, ends up you know, uh, multiplied by 2 to the power of negative 1. And that's why bit 51 is the digit that is immediately to the right-hand side of the decimal point. Because it is representing whether we have a half or not. That's the job of bit 51. And then we just move from there all the way down to bit zero. And that's how we ended up with the answer of number five, part number five. Is that okay? Isn't that always going to be the case? Huh? Isn't that always going to be the case? Isn't it always going to be the case? Mm -hmm. Well, for a double it is. Mm -hmm. All right. So we get rid of that extra quote. This back quote is also basically here. There we go. 
All right, so the next question is asking step by step compute and express the mantissa of v, which is this particular number, as a mixed fraction in base 10. So I think I explained what is a mixed fraction already. It has a whole number part and a fraction part. All right, so let's see how we can, what we can do with this. So the, the number that we have is basically one point, and I cannot remember the exact pattern, so I have to go back to take a look. All right, so we are looking, this is bit 51, this is bit 50, and so on. So this is basically the digit immediately to the right-hand side of the point. So we have 11001001, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so 1100, one, zero, zero, I just have to write down the answer here, 11001001, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and then a whole bunch of zeros. This is in base two. This is my entire mantissa, and I want to express this as a mixed fraction. So the way you turn this into a mixed fraction is basically to say, okay, this becomes one plus one divided by two uh, plus one divided by four. And what is the next one? So let me show you why I know you know, it has to be divided by two and four. So this is the uh, one half, this is the quarter, this is the eighth, 16, so we have a 30 second here, and then no 64, no 128, and one 256. So that's how we figure out you know, the uh, denominator of each fraction. So now we have the fraction of one divided by, um, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, so that would be 32, and then we got one more. So this time we have the fraction of um, two to the, so I'm just doing the counting here. The count, the way I count is, um, so let's look at this side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is representing whether we have a one divided by two, divided by two to the power of eight, which is 256. So we do have one of those. So now we take this and then we do, we turn it into one, you know, mixed fraction here. So this becomes one plus in the fraction. I'm going to use the common denominator of 256. So if I have a denominator of 256, the one half is going to have a numerator of 128. The quarter is going to have a numerator of 64. The 32nd is going to have a numerator of 8. And then finally, the you know, 1 divided by 256 is just 1 over here. And, and I just have to add up everything. So it becomes 1 and something divided by 256. And this is now just arithmetic, which is adding 128 plus 64 is 192. 200, 200. So it becomes 201 divided by 256. So for this part, you can use a calculator for sure. Okay, so let me just double check my math is right. So 128 plus 64 is 192. 192 plus 8 is 1, 200. 200 plus 1 is 201. So that seems right to me. So that answers this portion. Okay, this is what the mantissa is representing as a mixed fraction in base 10. And then the last part over here, wait, nope, this is correct, okay. So the last part is combining all the previous steps to figure out what is the value being represented. So this as a gigantic equation is the sine, which is just one, times um, the mantissa, which is one um, and 201 divided by 256 times 2 to the power of the mantissa, uh, to the exponent of 2, which we know is a 7 already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or get rid of some of the unnecessary DRs. There we go. <laughs> Just have a whole bunch of those. All right, so there we go. All right.
So now we can you know, figure out you know, this math by hand, or if you use a calculator, that works too. So now we look at this, and the one times you know, is not useful, so we are really just looking at one, you know, 201 divided by 256 times 2 to the power of 7. So I'm going to do some simplifications here. So it becomes, um, let's see, what is 2 to the power of 7 is 128. And then I use another mixed fraction. 256 and the 156 cancel out so that we have a 2 as a denominator. But the numerator stays the same as 201. And then this becomes 128 plus. Um, so now we have to look at 201 divided, divided by 2. That is just 100 and 1 half. So when we add up everything here, it is 228.5. The final answer. All right. Well, just in time. Do we have any questions? Hmm. Hmm. Say that again. Yep. This is one twenty-eight. Yeah, I will. I will do that. Do we have any questions about the anything that we have covered today in the practice exam? This is the exact exam from last semester, so this is not it's not watered down by any means. This is exactly the same exam as in last semester. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I don't remember anywhere I quote bit 64. There's no bit 64 when you have 63 bits, to, 64 bits to begin with. So either I misspoke or it is in a uh, different context. The question three, number two. Number two. Because we come from zero. The, the rightmost bit is bit zero. Okay. That's okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and then an earlier question, it was asking the minimum number of bits. Yes. Um, and that was in the case, it was, you just add one more if, if, it, had, if it had a negative. Mm. Or is that the case for positive numbers as well? All right. So the way you determine the number of bits that are needed in signed representation is to say, if I want to represent nine, you know, what is the minimum width to do it? So you know, there are two ways to do it. Uh, what I did not demonstrate here is, okay, I need to go back to that question. Give me a second. All right. So we are talking about this one here. So basically what you need to do is to figure out, you have to use the range of values to figure out, okay, if I have four bits, can I do the job, right? So if I want to represent nine, and I only have four bits, when you look at a signed integer that, that only has four bits, according to the equation, it can only represent negative eight to the power of the percent. Nine is not within that range. But when you have five bits, then we can represent negative 16 all the way to positive 15, which barely includes nine, because you know, it's, four bits is not enough, five is just enough, so five is the minimum number of bits in order to represent. All 
Great. Any other questions? So the, the exam is not, okay, some parts of it is about knowledge, okay, which is, you know, do you know, you know what is the definition of blah, okay? But most of the points has to do with can you apply the knowledge? So it's not just about do you know where to find the definition, but also can you use those definitions in order to solve a puzzle? Every question is essentially a puzzle to be solved. Okay, so it's about mostly about the application of the knowledge, and the minor part is about do you know something. Are we good so far? And I'm not sure how many of you have tried out the AI generated question at the end of each module. Some of those are actually pretty useful. So I would advise you to you know, give it a look if you have not yet done so. Yep. Two possibilities. I mean, since we have the test and we said that we can bring in the paper, can we just print the, the exam with the answers and then have it? Yes. The main reason for that for me is because the wording tends to confuse me a lot sometimes. So if I know what you asked me on the previous test, I already know how I should answer the question you asked me. But your exam may not have the same wording. Regardless of how it is that it's You can bring it, yes. So the answer is yes. Okay. So I'll I'll break up my answer into two parts. One is yes, technically you can bring anything you want that is either printed on paper or handwritten. But the two, the number two is um if the issue is about how I phrase the question, then there are, okay, first of all, you can ask for clarification in the exam. So if you're not sure what I'm asking, you can come to me during the exam and ask, okay, my understanding is you're asking about this. Is my interpretation of the question correct? I can always answer those, okay? Um, but the second thing is, you know, I'm not sure how this is going to work is to learn how to read the way I describe the questions. Um, you're not the only person, by the way. Okay? <laughs> there, there, there have been multiple people who say, you know, Tech, the way you say something is confusing, okay? which is not of, out of my intention. Okay? There was no intention whatsoever for me to make things confusing, but it's, sometimes it just kind of comes out that way. <clears throat> So I'm not sure whether that's a <laughs> just a style, writing style kind of issue. I mean, if you guys can think of a better way for me to rephrase these questions, you can let me know so I can you know, learn how to phrase the questions in a more intuitive way. You know, but of all the things in my mind, these are the most specific way for me to phrase a question to ask for what I want you guys to, to be able to answer. Any other questions? Yep. So you can use your board, keyboard to play them out. Yes, it is actually stated at the very beginning, which I did not cover today, but I did talk about it, I think, on Monday. So, um, yep, all questions carry equal weight. Because that's the only way, because you need this assumption in order to strategize, you know, how you want to prioritize the questions, because you always want to start with the question, at least in your mind, is the easiest. So you may not even answer the question in this order, okay? You might say, oh, okay, question number three is the easiest. I'm gonna start with question number three, okay? So you always want to start with the question that you feel the most confident about, not because of your building confidence or anything like that, just because you want to maximize the amount of points you're getting, okay? No, I just add them up. Okay. Right. So this is how your score is going to be uh, computed. So every part, you know, as much as I can possibly give you the number of points, this one is a little harder to give you individual points values. Basically, I just add up everything, um, but it would end up with the same weight as all the other questions. So for these guys, you know, you know this is 5%, this is 10%, you know, next one is 35%. So for each part of the question, I will give it a zero to four ranking, 
you know, zero means no answer, or the, the answer does not indicate any understanding whatsoever of what I'm asking. A four is basically a 4.0, which is an A, which means it's the perfect answer. Cannot be improved any further. It's the GPA, okay, from zero all the way to four. So every single part of the question is going to be scored from zero to four. And then the percentage is multiplied by that score to give you a weighted you know, sum at the end for each question. And then all the questions will be added together and then divided by four to give you a zero to four score for the entire exam. Is that okay? So that directly relates to the GPA, okay? So for someone who's getting, let's say, a 3.5 out of four for the entire exam, that means, you know, in terms of letter grade, that would be equivalent to somewhere right in between A and B. Because an A is a 4.0, a B is a 3.0, so a 3.5 is right in between an A and a B. Is that okay? So occasionally, I do make my test a little bit too hard, okay, which means that the top score of the whole class is only getting, let's say, a 3.5 out of 4. It's okay. So what I do is I take the 90 percentile, the person who's the 90 percentile of the entire class, and turn that score into a perfect score. And then just rescale the whole class based on that. Is that okay? So that means, you know, this class, I think this is my Monday, Wednesday class, I think we only have 24 students in this class. So I'm gonna take the third highest score of the entire class and turn that into 100%. So everybody else is just going to get rescaled accordingly, which also means in this class, two people at least are guaranteed. Okay, I shouldn't say that. In most cases, <laughs> two people are guaranteed to exceed 100%. You guys would go like, but isn't that always the case? No, because if there are three people all getting the same top score, if the top three people of this class are getting exactly the same score, then that becomes the new 100% and nobody's gonna get more than 100%. Is that making any sense? All right. But I don't do it the other way around, okay? You know, in other words, if the whole class, okay, if the worst score of this entire class is a 95%, I don't rescale the whole thing so that somebody's gonna get a B, okay? That is not what I do, how I do things. I only scale up, I don't scale down. <clears throat> but when you transition to certain UCs whom, which I shall not name, they do scale down as well. Because the philosophy of some of those professors is in any class, only a certain percentage of people should be getting A's and certain percentage of people should be getting B's. The rest, you can get all the D's and C's. <laughs> but I shall not name that your particular UC or two UCs. <clears throat> All right, so are there any additional questions about how this whole thing is gonna happen? How are you gonna study? Okay, you know, so study strategy is important, okay? You know, do not overlearn from the exam that we just talked about, okay? So you guys go like, what do you mean by overlearning? Overlearning means you, know, you are just hammering the entire process of how I answer each part of each question and you're just trying to memorize the whole process because your question is not going to be the same. So you're not going to be reapplying re exactly the same steps or the same process. So the idea is you want to stay flexible and go like, I want to learn the knowledge. I want to learn you know, how to apply the knowledge to answer any kind of question within the scope. Because even I have no idea what your questions are going to look like because I haven't thought about it yet. I can tell you one thing, is it's not going to be the same as what you see here. All right? Yep? Are you taking roll? I'm not taking roll today, so we are good. Um, so I, I am not giving you guys a lab today, even though technically I can, but I'm not giving you a lab today. But I will stay here as long as somebody is here and want to talk to me about the exam, or any material that we have already talked about so far. So the, the class is technically dismissed. You guys can go get your lunch, do whatever you want. 
but I will stay here to answer questions as long as anyone here still has a question, I'll stay here. So think of this as my extended office hour. I will stop the recorder and upload and also send you guys the